Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second uh, bi-monthly employment law update. It's lovely to have you all here with us today. Um, absolutely delighted to say that I'm joined today by my colleague, Nikki Weir, who is a senior associate in our immigration team. Um, so the order of events today is Nikki's going to do a session on top 10, 10 tips in relation to carrying out right to work checks. Um, I'm then going to do a bit of an update on three quite interesting cases over the last couple of months that I thought it would be helpful just to chat through. We'll do a little bit of um, coverage of what's in the news from an employment law point of view and just again a bit of an update on legislation as well at the end. Um, I don't know whether you'll be delighted to hear or gutted to hear that we're not going to spend much time on the job support scheme today. Um, I will cover it very briefly when we're talking about stuff in the news. If you're keen to hear about the job support scheme, we did a session on Tuesday this week, which has been recorded. So I think that's going to be issued to the database if it hasn't been already. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to to watch that if you're if you're keen to listen back to it. I see someone saying that they can't hear me. Hopefully most of you can hear me. Um, yeah, I can too. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> um, right, grand. Without further ado, I'll pass over to Nikki then um, to chat to you about the right to work checks. All right, Nikki. Thanks, Morag. Hello, hello. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a chat about right to work checks. And um, now I appreciate that at the best of times, immigration can be a bit of a dry subject and in particular right to work checks, I understand, are not everyone's favourite thing to do. Um, but I do think it's something that's important. It's something that we see time and time again coming up as an issue. Um, and I was actually prompted to speak about this from a conversation I had with my own mum who runs a small business in my hometown and um, she was getting ready to open back up again after lockdown and I just in passing said to her oh you do all your right to work checks don't you and she just looked at me blankly as if she had no idea what I was talking about um, and I said oh, you know you know you check everyone's documents make sure they have a right to work and she was saying what you mean like health and safety checks and had no clue what I was talking about um, so it made me think that, right, OK, this is something that um, isn't always at the forefront of employers' minds, particularly, I think, with small businesses. And that's certainly where we see a lot of problems, um, but um, often with larger companies where there's established HR procedures and, and HR teams, it's less of an issue. However, I don't think it's a bad thing. To have a refresher, make sure um, that everyone's up to speed on right to work checks and um, that um, they, they know when um, they need to carry them out, they know how to carry them out and where there's any sort of discrepancies or issues that arise, they know where to go to, to find the answers. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to run through my top 10 tips. Um, and if anyone has any questions at all, then I'll stick around and happy to answer um, at the end. Um, so my first tip is that um, it's important to carry out checks for all new employees. So the, the right to work checks have been in place um, from February 2008. Um, so technically anyone employed before that um, doesn't fall under the, this regime. Um, so anyone that you've employed from 2008, from February 2008, there is an expectation that you will have carried out um, right to work checks. So it is a bit of a common misconception um, that checks need to only be carried out on foreign migrants. Um, that is obviously not the case. They should be carried out for all new employees. Um, and it can be risky to assume that someone has a right to work. Um, and that's... Um, that's something that um, came out um, of my conversation with um, my mother. Well, her, her, her response was, well, everyone's British, so I don't need to carry out checks. And that is something that we see quite a lot. Um, but the reality is, without carrying out the checks, how do you know everyone's British? Um, so it's dangerous. It, it's dangerous to assume that because somebody has a British name, looks British, sounds British, what does that even mean anymore? But, uh, you know, what 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 does that mean to say, well, somebody sounds British, so they must be, I don't need to carry out a check. So the reality is you do need to, and you do need to do it for everybody that, that comes to work for you. Timing is key. Um, now you should ensure that your checks are carried out um, before an employee starts working for you. It's good practice to 
offer a role subject to a candidate having a right to work and to carry out the checks before the candidate starts working. Now, in reality, that will often mean having a 10 minute conversation um, with somebody and checking their documents on the day they start, um, you know, maybe getting them to come in 10 minutes early um, and to sit down with you and go through their, their check before then. That's absolutely fine. Um, but it should be before they, they, they start working. Um, now, Obviously, in times of um, a pandemic, we're not all working in the office um, and the home office have um, introduced a sort of concession around right to, to, to work checks at the moment, whereby um, it is acceptable to see a, an emailed version of a document and to carry out your checks um, via, uh, uh, via video call. Now, ordinarily, that wouldn't be acceptable to them. But for the time being, they will accept that on the understanding that as soon as you're you're back in the office, you should do a follow up, um, a follow up check. At the moment, you do have an option um, as to whether you carry out manual or online checks. So most employers will be used to carrying out your your manual checks. From last year, it's been possible to carry out um, online checks, and that's using a home loft home office website and they have a view a job applicants right to work details um section um now that involves you getting the consent of of the prospective employee um, and they provide you with a code which allows you to log into the home office um system and view their right to work online this service is new it's only been in as i say since last year it's not available for every migrant um, and you absolutely shouldn't discriminate against a migrant who doesn't provide a code. Um, so if somebody says, I'm not providing your code, I'm not prepared to do it, I don't have a code, then don't take that as them not having a right to work. It may just mean that they don't fall under this system. At the moment, you're probably more likely to come across this um, with EU nationals who are registered under the, the EU settlement scheme um, but it's something that we will probably see more of so it's something you should be aware of that these online checks are available um, although probably a lot of your checks will still fall under the, the manual route. When you are carrying out uh, a manual check um, then it's important that you see the original ID document and this is a, a, a an issue we, we see time and time again um, where I, I've certainly come across it myself where I've started with employers that, that um, shall remain nameless. Um, when I've started, they've said, oh, can you just send me an, uh, your, your passport, just email it to me. That's not enough. Um, you need to actually sit down with your employer and show them your passport. They have to have it in front of them. It's not enough for them just to see a scanned version of it. Um, the onus is is on the the employer to look through the the document and be satisfied that it is genuine. Um, so it's it, it's often assumed that that an ID document is acceptable, um, but generally, apart from the concession at the moment, which I've mentioned due to the the pandemic, generally it's not enough. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And even as I say, if you are using scan documents and video checking by video call at the moment, that's something that you should follow up when you're you're back in the office and do a, an in-person meeting with the employee. The checks should be carried out in the presence of the candidate. And again, I think this is something that we quite often see um, employers not carrying out properly. Um, you, It's not enough just to take uh, the passport, say, great, I'll copy that. Here you go. End of check. What you should do and what the Home Office expects you to do is to sit down with the, the employee and look through the document the onus is on you as the employer to examine the ID document um, or the ID photo on the online check. You need to take your time and check that the person on the ID is the same person in front of you. And when in doubt, ask questions. And that's something that's really important because that can be a little bit awkward. You could have somebody in front of you who looks very different to the person in the, their, their passport. 
that happens um you might have somebody that you know something really simple that they've changed their hair color they've put on weight they've lost weight they you know they might have been pregnant when they got their photo taken and they look very different now there's lots of different things that can make you question whether the person you've got in front of you is actually the person that's in the, the document. And that's something really important. And the Home Office position is that you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. Now, I, I, I appreciate there can be a, a fine line sometimes. Um, if you're worried about discrimination and things, and that's something obviously to, to bear in mind. And when in doubt, take advice take advice speak to your employment solicitor speak to your immigration solicitor and take advice if you're not sure on what questions you should be asking um but always have at the back of your mind that the onus is on you as the employer to make sure that you are satisfied that the person in front of you is the person um in the id document um also you are expected not to be an expert on on document authenticity however the expectation is that if there's something glaringly obvious um, and something that would be obvious to a reasonable person that you should be flagging this so you know for example if it looks to you as if a document has been tampered with as if a photo has been changed a name altered a date of birth altered you have to ask the question um, and again, don't be afraid to ask the question. You're not expected to be an expert, but if there's something that's very obvious to you, then um, it could come back on you if the Home Office say, well, actually, we think that you should have picked up on this. Um, this would be obvious to anyone looking at it. Um, so again, I keep going back to this, I keep emphasising it. It's not enough to simply have a copy of the, the, the document you need to inspect it and make sure that you're happy that it's authentic. If you're not sure, one of my top tips is to ask for additional documents to link the candidate to their ID if necessary. One of the common things you might see is where a candidate produces an ID document in a different name to that which they're being employed under. In that situation, the onus is on you as the employer to be satisfied again that the person in the ID and the person in front of you are, are one and the same. So I think the most common issue arises with this where a candidate goes by a married name. Um, quite often in some countries, it's not routine for a passport to be updated um, to reflect a person's married name, but they might be living in the UK and using their, their married name day to day. Um, in that situation, you should be asking for linking documents if you're not satisfied. Um, so, for example, you've got somebody um, who has taken a job under the name Nicola Weir. You've got a passport in front of you that says Nicola Robertson. There will most likely be a straightforward explanation. The person will say, yep, got married last year. Great. Can I see a copy of the marriage certificate? Keep a copy of that on their file. You have a linking document. Um, and if the Home Office have any questions for you as to that person's right to work, you're able to say, yeah, I did pick up on that. And here's how I addressed it. And that should protect you um, if, if it transpires at a later date that that person doesn't have a right to work. So that's something I think that's really important is that um, Yes, you've got your sort of core documents that you need to see, but sometimes you will have to use your initiative and, and go beyond that slightly. And that's OK. And that's what you need to do to, to protect yourself. Nikki, there's a question that's come in here about yeah. what if what if you had a copy of the document verified by a third party like a solicitor? Would that be enough? Uh, no. Um, so the onus, again, is on you as the employer. The buck stops with you as the employer. So whilst I explain. Right, I tell you what, I'll kick into my bit just now and uh, hopefully we'll get Nikki back. I'll just type her a wee message here to let her know. Um, I'm going to cover the employment stuff and hopefully we will get you back soon, Nikki. 
oh my goodness, this all just becomes very stressful, doesn't it? Right, let's look at some of the employment cases in and hopefully we can get Nikki back with her sound on very soon. I'm going to look at three cases. Um, the first one, oh, here we go again, is this topic of employment status, but I just want to flag to a recent ET decision on, on that issue. Um, and then I've got two cases on disciplinary issues. One is all about... Um, what the impact of an appeal is against dismissal when it comes to a constructive unfair dismissal claim and you're going to have to listen to that one very carefully because i have to tell you it's taken me a while to get my <laughs> my head around the various steps that took place in that case and then the third case is one that i think is really important which is to do with when you dismiss someone because you've got concerns about reputational damage um and i have to say it's something that we see fairly regularly where an employer has taken an employee through a disciplinary process and one of the reasons they ultimately give for the reason to dismiss on grounds of gross misconduct is the pers is a damage to the reputation of the organisation. So there's a really interesting case on that that we'll, we'll cover off. So if I start first then with the employment status case, um, this is a case of OH Tiama against City Sprint. And for those of you that follow the cases in this area at all, you will know that City Sprint have been quite unlucky because this is the second claim that's been brought against them um, in relation to employment status. So um, the case here involved a number of cycle couriers who had a contract that stated that they were self-employed um, but their position was that they were actually workers and the reason why that is really relevant obviously being a worker doesn't give you the same rights as being an employee but what it does give you is an entitlement to holiday pay and that can obviously be worth a fair amount of money so a um, group of cycle couriers brought a claim against city sprint saying that they were workers rather than self-employed now, back in 2017, we had a, another case brought against City Sprint on pretty much exactly the same topic. Um, and in that case, although the contracts for the couriers stated that they were self-employed and not workers, um, the courts held that in actual fact they were workers. And the kind of, I suppose, the position that the courts adopted was, yes, we'll look at the contract and see what it says, but actually, and many of you will be familiar with this, we'll also look behind the contract and see what happens in practice. And one of the main reasons why in that case the tribunal said that the couriers were workers rather than self-employed was because there was no right to substitution in the contract and if any of you have been involved in putting together contracts for workers and self-employed and trying to ensure that they're not classed as employees or workers if they are meant to be self-employed I'm sure you've had that conversation about ensuring there's a clause in the contract that says that the individual has a right of substitution so if they can't carry out the work they can arrange for somebody else to come in and do it in their place so there was no substitution clause in the contract prior to the claim that was brought against City Sprint in 2017. They lost that claim and so what they immediately did then was changed all of their contracts and they wrote into the contract this right of substitution. So they were then faced with this further case a couple of months ago and it's just an employment tribunal decision but I think it's quite an interesting one where in that what City Sprint did was they said well okay we accept that up until 2017 these individuals were workers because we didn't have a right of substitution clause in the contract. However, we changed all the contracts in 2017. So from 2017 to date, um, our position is that they're genuinely self-employed and that they're not workers. And what the couriers argued was, well, you maybe changed our contracts in 2017, but in practice, absolutely nothing changed. I still continue to perform the role in exactly the same way that I did prior to the contract change. Yes, there's a right of substitution, it's never been used, um, so it's just written into the contract, but it's never been exercised. And also the uh, tribunal held that in this case there was an element of control over the couriers as well and the way that they carried out their job. So that was also taken into account. And what the tribunal said, and it's very similar then to the decision in 2017, and it shows there's a real theme now when you're looking at these cases of employment status, um, and the theme being notwithstanding what you have in your contract the tribunal will always look behind that and will always look to see what happens in practice and that's exactly what the employment tribunal said here they said that, you know it's fair enough you've put that into the contract but when we look at the situation in reality you've never provided a substitute nothing's changed and therefore these individuals are 
workers rather than self-employed. So it then came on to the question of, well, what holiday pay were they entitled to? And interestingly, within the contract, City Sprint had put wording to say that any entitlement to holiday pay would be rolled up as part of the individual's payment. And of course, many of you will be familiar with the fact that rolled up holiday pay is not really acceptable. Um, but what the Employment Tribunal said in this case as well was, although you've got that clause in the contract saying that you're rolling up holiday pay, you've not actually assigned a specific amount to the holiday pay. Um, and therefore, it, the, the, the clause is completely invalid. It, it doesn't work. And so the individuals are, are entitled to back pay for their holiday pay. So if you like, it's kind of 2-0 <laughs> to the couriers against City Sprint. Um, but I think it's a helpful case just to show that that's absolutely the position really that's been taken in so many of these cases now. You can draft a beautiful contract, but what the courts will look at is what actually happens in practice. Okay, so that's our employment status case. Um, I said to you the second one I'm going to cover now, as I say, get ready, <laughs> get ready to listen to the order of events in this one. But the second one I'm going to cover is a, a case that dealt with a question about if an appeal is upheld, what impact does that have on the original dismissal um, in a disciplinary process? OK, so this case is a case of Phoenix Academy Trust against Kilroy, and it was a, an employment appeal tribunal decision in the last couple of months. And what happened in this case was the employee was going through a disciplinary process um, and they'd had the disciplinary hearing and the employer then contacted the employee to advise him that he'd been dismissed on the grounds of gross misconduct. That was step one. <laughs> step two, which was pretty much immediate, um, I suspect perhaps the correspondence was going either way or crossing over at the same time. Step two was the claimant then resigned and it was just after his dismissal. And he raised a claim for constructive unfair dismissal. And what he said was his claim related to the way the disciplinary process had been carried out and the hearing and the, the, you know, the, the, he kind of saw the writing on the wall and saw that the ultimate decision was going to be the termination of his employment. So he's been dismissed. He then resigns. Um, the claimant then appealed against the decision to terminate his employment. Now, you might think, well, why did he do that? That seems daft. The reason he's done that is because I imagine he's been advised, well, although you resigned, just immediately before your resignation, you were dismissed. So if you're going to pursue a, a tribunal claim, really, you need to be able to demonstrate that you raised an appeal against your dismissal to strengthen your claim as much as possible. It's not a necessity, but it certainly helps to strengthen a claimant's claim in that sort of situation. So step three, the claimant puts in an appeal against his dismissal. Um, step four, the appeal hearing takes place. And yep, you guessed it. The outcome of the appeal hearing was that he was issued with a final written warning and he was reinstated. So he was back as an employee again. Um, so then, yeah, step five, the claimant then resigned. <laughs> and so the argument at tribunal was, what can he rely on in relation to his constructive unfair dismissal claim? Because his claim was articulated kind of in, in two parts, effectively. It was based on the way in which the original disciplinary process hearing and dismissal had been carried out. Um, and it was also based on the way the appeal process had been carried out. And so the question for the tribunal was, if you dismiss someone and then you re-engage them or, or you bring them back into work as part of their appeal against their dismissal, what impact does that have on the original dismissal? And what the Employment Appeal Tribunal said is, it effectively means the dismissal never took place. Okay, So it meant that the claimant in this case couldn't rely on any of the issues that had taken place in relation to his disciplinary process up to his first dismissal um, because because the employer had allowed the appeal and reinstated the employee, it was as if the dismissal had never happened at all. So it meant that his constructive unfair dismissal claim was limited only to the issues round about the appeal process, um, which made it much more difficult for him to pursue the claim, because I think there were probably bigger issues with the disciplinary process than there was with the appeal process. Um, so just quite an interesting case. It's something that you might not come up or come across that often, but helpful to know, I think, that if you do reinstate someone, if if you've gone through a disciplinary process and it hasn't been handled particularly well, and you then re reinstate them on appeal, 
you're effectively wiping away all the problems that took place with the disciplinary because it's as if that dismissal never took place. Um, although I appreciate it's quite a big step if you've dismissed someone <laughs> to take them back to work purely to avoid the risk of a, a, a claim. If you feel there might have been some kind of procedural errors with your process, but it was still right ultimately to reach the decision to terminate their employment. It means you're likely to lose any subsequent unfair dismissal claim. Um, but you should be able to argue, well, even if we'd followed the process absolutely fairly, we would have still ended up dismissing the employee. And so any award that he's entitled to should be limited to the loss that they've suffered because of, you know, if the if the disciplinary process has been shortened in any way because of our procedural flaws. OK, so that was the case of Phoenix Academy Trust against Kilroy. Um, the third case I want to cover then is the case of K against L. And I said to you, I'm particularly interested in this case because of um, the this whole issue of well, one of the reasons for dismissal was potential damage to our reputation. Um, it is, as I said, it's an issue that comes up a lot in discussion with clients, and I absolutely understand there can be that real concern for your organisation if something's happened with an employee um, and it gets out via social media or generally whatever, and it impacts on the organisation's reputation. That is always a big concern for employers, understandably so. But let me talk you through what happened in this case. So um, the claimant in this case was a teacher and he was charged by the police with possessing indecent images of children. Uh, they carried out a bit of a, an investigation, the police, but they decided not to prosecute because they said that there was insufficient evidence. However, they reserved the right to prosecute in the future. I assume should further evidence transpire. So that was the police process. It was stopped, put to one side. The claimant then spoke to his employer and explained what had happened. And the employer decided to invite the claimant to a disciplinary hearing. And the employer wrote to the claimant and explained that the allegation against the claimant was that he was in possession of indecent images of children. And you can imagine the concern that that caused when you're looking at a teacher who's obviously working with children. So you can, you can see that kind of anxiety build up within the school about this whole issue of, of reputation. And I have to say, and I've seen this in a number of cases that I've dealt with, often what happens is because people have that real concern at the beginning of the process, there, there's not a moment to just kind of stop and think about things. It's, it's just a, it kind of drives the whole process then. Well, you know, we just can't keep this person. We're really concerned about it. And it can drive that whole process and it can lead to flaws in the process, which we'll, we'll come to look at in a moment, because I suspect that's what's happened here. So teacher was asked to a disciplinary hearing. At the hearing, he explained, <laughs> nothing like throwing your children under the bus, but he explained that he had a son and a, he thinks his, his son and perhaps his son's friend had access to laptop. Um, and so it wasn't him, it was somebody else effectively was, was what he said. Now, the decision of the disciplinary chair was that there was insufficient evidence that the teacher had downloaded the um, the images onto the laptop. And you'll remember in disciplinary hearings, the burden of proof is not beyond all reasonable doubt. It's not like a criminal trial. The burden of proof is on the balance of probabilities. Do we think this person did it? Or another way of expressing it is, do I think it's more likely they did it than they didn't? Um, I always kind of talk about you only have to be 51% sure that the person did what they're alleged to have done, which I appreciate is a kind of weird way to measure it. But um, the disciplinary chair decided that there was insufficient evidence, so they weren't going to uphold that allegation. However, they decided to dismiss the teacher anyway, and the reasons they gave was that they felt there was an unacceptable risk to the children having the teacher in the school, and also they were very concerned about the reputational damage, particularly if the police did come back. You remember the police had said that they reserved the right to prosecute in the future. So particularly if the police did come back um, and prosecute and it turned out that the school knew about it before and hadn't done anything about it. So that was their concern. And again, I have a lot of sympathy with that. Um, however, when the case went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, well, interestingly, the Employment Tribunal, the Employment Tribunal said it was a fair dismissal. Um, and that they were quite comfortable with the, the decision that had been taken. That was then appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and the Employment Appeal Tribunal reversed the Employment Tribunal's decision and they said, no, no, it was an unfair dismissal. And the reason for that was 
The teacher couldn't have been dismissed for misconduct, which was the allegation that he was originally invited to the disciplinary hearing to respond to, because the disciplinary chair's finding was that there was insufficient evidence that he had downloaded the images. And that was the allegation, that was the misconduct allegation that he had downloaded inappropriate images to his computer. So the chair had said, no, there's insufficient evidence for that. So that meant he couldn't have been dismissed on the grounds of misconduct. Um, in reality, the reason why he was dismissed, and it was referred to in the outcome letter, was this concern about reputational damage. But what the Employment Appeal Tribunal said there was, if you're dismissing someone on the grounds of reputational damage, that's not misconduct. You remember, you've got your five fair reasons for dismissal, misconduct, capability, redundancy, as a result of legislation, or some other substantial reason. And what the tribunal said is dismissing someone because you've got concerns about reputation to the organisation is not misconduct that would come under the some other substantial reason dismissal. But the challenge that the employer had here is when they invited the teacher to the disciplinary hearing, all the invite letter said was it's to address the allegation that you've downloaded inappropriate images of children to your computer. There was no reference in the invite letter to concerns about reputational damage. There was no reference in the invite letter to the fact that he could potentially be dismissed on the grounds of some other substantial reason. Come back to that in a moment. Um, and he didn't get any opportunity at the hearing. That, that allegation or that assertion, if you like, was never put to him at the hearing. So he didn't get the opportunity to respond to this assertion that his behaviour could damage the reputation of the school. And I said I'd come back to the letter in the SOSR point. Um, I think this is a really clumsy situation. You know when you're drafting a letter inviting an employee to a disciplinary hearing, and if there's a risk of dismissal on the grounds of gross misconduct, you should put that into the letter. And the idea is it's to make sure the employee fully understands the potential seriousness of the disciplinary hearing. Um, Strictly speaking, if you're also looking at potentially dismissing someone on the grounds of some other substantial reason, the invite letter should make that clear. This could lead to the termination of your employment on the grounds of some other substantial reason. Now, that's all very well from a legal point of view, um, but I have a lot of sympathy for whoever's drafting letters in those situations and for the receiver of those letters, because what on earth does that mean to an employee? You may be dismissed on the grounds of some other substantial reason. They don't know that that's one of the five fair reasons for dismissal. They don't know that that's you know what that means. So then you get yourself into this whole palaver of trying to explain in the invite letter what dismissal on the grounds of some other substantial reason means. So I do have a lot of sympathy with that. It does feel very clumsy. I've been involved in drafting a few and it just never feels quite right. Um, but that's what the EAT said in this decision. You didn't, it wasn't included in the invite letter, you didn't discuss it at the hearing, so you couldn't then dismiss someone on the grounds of damage to reputation, and it was therefore an unfair dismissal. What they went on to say, though, was even if you had covered it at the disciplinary hearing, and even if you had covered it in the letter, um, our view is there's insufficient evidence for you to say that there could be damage to the reputation. You know, you've not, if you, and this is the point I think that is very important in these reputation type cases. You have to be able to demonstrate why you think there could be a damage to the organisation's reputation. And I do think it's one of those phrases that's just used too easily in outcome letters. Um, but actually, you know, is the risk of damage to reputation actually real? And that's what the Employment Appeal Tribunal said. You have to be able to demonstrate that the risk to, of damage to reputation is actually a real risk. So you don't just stick that in these letters because it's another thing that you can say, well, it's, you know, it's we uphold the misconduct, plus we also think there's a reputational issue here. I don't know if any of you are aware, it's one of my favourite cases from a few years ago. I can't remember which supermarket it was, and some of you will have heard me tell this story before, but... Um, five employees of a supermarket were in the storeroom and they decided to blow up, you know, the plastic bags that you get in supermarkets, tie them and hit each other with them. Um, and in their wisdom, they decided to record it. <laughs> and it was published, I think, on YouTube or I can't remember. Um, and so they were all called into a disciplinary hearing and they were all dismissed on the grounds of damage, of rep damage to reputation of the, the supermarket. But actually, when it got to the tribunal hearing, um, evidence was 
shown on the YouTube channel. You know how you can you can see how many people have viewed the video, and uh, there was only five viewers of the video. <laughs> you can, I, I'm fairly certain the five viewers will have been the five individuals that were involved in the fight. Uh, and the tribunal in that case said, "How can you dismiss on the grounds of reputational damage? You know, they have this real fear of this YouTube video going viral when actually there's evidence here to show that only five people have watched the video." Um, so it, it's just I, I labour the point quite a bit, but the, you know there's a reason for that, and it's because we do see this quite often damage to reputation as a reason for dismissal. You have to be very, very careful how you use it. Um, so that's my three cases. I have no idea if Nikki's back online or not, uh, but I'll press on for the moment with the in the news stuff and the legislation stuff, and then hopefully we can see if Nikki's able to, to join us again before we conclude. Um, so in the news, uh, I said I wasn't going to cover the job support scheme in any detail, and I'm not. And as I say, we can send you the recording to the session we did on Tuesday if you've not already got it. Um, but obviously it's very much in the news. And I think the kind of key criticism of it is, well, who on earth is going to use it? Because if you, as the employer, have to pay 55% of an employee's salary when they're working 33% of their time, why would you do that? Why would you not just employ one person full time and pay them 100% of their salary rather than three people part time and effectively then be paying 165% of salary? And the other point that I, I kind of thought about the other day, and I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me the previous week was, again, from an employer's point of view, if you're going to reduce an employee's salary or the, their working time to a third of the time that they normally work, and it can, the way the scheme works, it can be a third of their time or more. And as I say, we'll, we cover all of that in the other session. But if you're going to reduce them to a third of their hours, why would you not just seek to agree a change in terms and conditions with them and have them work a third of their hours and pay them for a third, but not have to pay that extra top up of 22%? Now, you obviously might get pushback from the employee for that because they'll think, well, if you use the job support scheme, I could be getting paid 77% of my salary for working a third of my time because the employer pays a third. The government then pays 22%, which is a third of a third. <laughs> and the um, the, employ the employer also pays the 22%. Um, but interestingly, on the session we did on Tuesday, we just took a quick poll at the end to see how many, I think there was about 240 people in the session and how many of their organisations were thinking about using the job support scheme. Um, and the answer was 9% of those that were on the, the call. To be fair, 45% said they didn't know. And I imagine the number of you are in this situation as well, where you're still looking at the detail of the scheme and trying to work out whether you should use it or not. But it feels to me like it's almost a moral decision for employers, whether they use the job support scheme, because it's going to cost them more. And it's really whether they think, well, actually, we're really keen to keep our staff in a job. And, that, and so we'll, you know, we'll use the scheme for that reason. Um, and it, it was Jen, actually, Jen Skiok, who many of you will know when we were doing the session on Tuesday, she was saying it's almost like um, the government are asking employers to pay a, a benefit of kind to um, employees to pay this extra 22% um, above the actual time that they're working. So I think our sense is some employers will use the scheme, but obviously it's not going to be used to the same extent as the furlough scheme. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it develops. The other thing we mentioned on the session on Tuesday was at the moment, all that's been published by the government is a fact sheet on how the scheme will operate. Um, they have promised more detailed guidance on questions like how do you work out normal hours? How do you work out what normal pay is? Although they have talked about a lot of that will be very similar to the way the furlough scheme operated. So once the detailed guidance comes out, I expect we'll probably arrange another Webex on the back of that just to, to chat through that. So that's the job support scheme. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention is, interestingly, HMRC have started issuing letters now to employers who they think have claimed too much under the furlough scheme. So I hope none of you are in receipt of those letters, but just to let you know that that's, that process is now underway. Um, also, the government have issued updated guidance on quarantine for employees. So um, this situation where if you've got employees who go away on holiday and have to come back and quarantine for 14 days, what are your options in that scenario? Um, I, mean, I think they're pretty straightforward anyway. The, the, the guidance encourages you, if the individual can work from home, the guidance encourages you to enable them to do that. If they can't work from home, then the guidance talks about asking them to take 
further holiday or an unpaid period of leave, these different kinds of options. So I imagine some of you have had to deal with that situation. And I know some of our clients are very concerned because they feel it's creating a them and us type situation because they've got some employees who can work from home, so can go on holiday and then quarantine for 14 days. And they've got other employees who just can't work from home and they're having to say to them, well, if you go, you know, you're going to have to take extra holiday or you're going to have to take unpaid leave. And it's creating a bit of tension between the different areas within the workplace. So uh, I know that can be a bit of an issue. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention in terms of in the news is the HR1 form. If any of you are looking at collective consultation um, and submitting an HR1 form to the, the relevant department within the government, the form's been updated. So just go online and make sure you use the updated form. The information itself hasn't changed too much. It's just the, the style of the form's been updated. And do remember it's a criminal offence if you don't submit the form in time. Um, so just keep that in mind. So that's the main things in the news. Um, in terms of legislation, just to flag, it's now an offence for employers to knowingly permit an employee to come to work when they should be self-isolating. Um, so just to flag that to you, hopefully it's not been an issue for any of you, but um, that's now become an offence for employers as from the 28th of September. Uh, and similarly, it's an offence for an employee to come to work when they should be self-isolating. Uh, just to put back on your radar, gosh, you know, if one good thing has come of this whole situation, it was the fact that IR35 was put on hold this year. Um, the kind of chatter at the moment is it will be implemented in April next year. So if you've down tools on that project and you need to pick them up again, now is probably a good time to start looking at it again. Um, IR35, April 2021. And I've mentioned before, but just if any of you haven't heard me say it, the introduction of new a new entitlement to neonatal leave. That's a, a way off. 2023 feels like a lifetime away at the moment, of course, but um, just to mention to you that that's on the horizon as well. So again, just something else to start thinking about. Now, I'm going to check and see if we have Nikki back. I am um, back. Can oh, you hear me? Well done, Nikki. Oh, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> You're just that. playing with my emotions, Nikki. <laughs> playing with my emotions. <laughs> um, right. Well, I'm absolutely delighted, even more so than I was the first time, <laughs> to hand over to Nikki so she can finish her top tips. And I hope your mum's listening, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about that, everyone. I'm not actually sure how long I was talking to myself for. I seem to lose all sound completely, but I think um, it was possibly at the point where somebody asked the question about using a third party to verify documents. Um, so the short answer to that is um, I expect that you probably will trust your solicitor and I expect that if they have verified the documents that um, it means that it is a genuine document. However, that is a risky um, it's, it's a risky move from an employer's point of view because technically that will not provide a statutory excuse for you against a civil penalty if it transpires that that person is working illegally. Um, so it won't be enough to say I got my solicitor to do it. The buck stops with you as your employer. So if you want to make sure that you're doing everything absolutely as you should be and that you are establishing a statutory excuse against any civil penalty, then um, the onus is really on you to check the document yourself in the presence of the employee um, or to use the, the online system. Um, so those are really your options and I would suggest that, that, that that's what you do rather than relying on third party verification. So back to my tips. Um, one of my tips is to make sure that you are religious about marking forward your um, follow up checks. So most of you will be aware that um, you'll either have your right to work checks that are permanent. So, for example, if somebody's giving you a British passport, no follow up checks required where somebody is providing a document that shows that their right to work is time limited and um, then you have to ensure um, that follow-up checks are carried out to verify their ongoing right to work. Um, that can come with its own difficulties. It's not uncommon for visa extension applications to be submitted um, and then for the original expiry date to pass before a decision is made on that. Um, in such cases, generally a migrant's leave will usually have been preserved. Um, that, that comes under Section 3C of the Immigration Act um, 1971. So you can um, what you would usually do if there's this period where it seems as if their leave may have lapsed, but um, an employee is saying to you, well, I've made an in-time application 
what you would usually do in that situation is um, use the employer checking service. Um, so usually I would give it a couple of weeks because it can take a while for the service to, to catch up and be updated. Um, but give it a couple of weeks after the date of, of, of application or past the date of expiry of the, the existing leave. Um, and then do your employer checking service check. That will hopefully return a positive verification notice that confirms that there is a new application pending and that that person um, therefore has a right to work in the interim. Um, what you should be aware of is that um, your positive verification notices will only be valid for six months. Um, so you would like to think that the Home Office would make a decision in six months, but it's certainly not unknown for them to take longer than that to make a decision on applications in particularly complex sort of outside of the rules applications. So in that situation, um, you would need to be updating your um, verification checks. So it's really important to make sure that you're really on the ball um, and marking forward important dates to, to carry up your, your follow up checks. Um, my next tip is to prepare for changes in 2021, um, particularly for EA nationals who've not yet demonstrated settled status. Um, so most of you will be aware at the moment that um, during the Brexit transitional period, it's enough for an EU national to provide a, a passport or proof of their EU nationality to show that they have a right to work. Um, at the moment, it certainly is good practice to be encouraging your employees to register with the EU settlement scheme, but it's not currently mandatory. So you can't force employees to register, but certainly it's, you know, a, a lot of our clients are sort of putting out communications with staff, encouraging those um, who are going to fall under the EU um, settlement scheme to, to think about registering now. Those who are in the UK by the end of this year will have until June 2021 to register. And anyone who doesn't register um, before that date or who relocates to the UK from the end of this year will require a visa to work in the UK, even if they're they're in EU national. So that's just something really important to have on your radar um, at the moment and, and be prepared um, for changes. I think there is going to be a, a, a period of confusion, I think is probably the best word for it, um, from the beginning of the year until June 2021, where technically you could have people that have arrived pre-2020, but who haven't registered under the scheme and who have until June to, to register. Um, it's going to become, I think, quite difficult for employers to sort of manage that and figure out who they actually need to get verification from. So I think um, be aware that there's going to be this period. And if you have any questions, I think um, it's, it's a good idea to take advice um, on what you should be doing to make sure that your own right to work checks are, are up to scratch. My next tip is to make sure you're retaining the documents for the required time period. And I think this is something that's particularly pertinent for those um, that also operate um, a sponsor license under the, the, the tier two sponsor system um, because your document retention periods are different for your standard right to work checks than they are for people that you're sponsoring under the tier two sponsorship process. So just be aware that you could feasibly have a, a, an employee who you have to keep some documents for for two years and some documents for for one year um, after their employment ends. So that's just something to be aware of. In general terms, your right to work checks, um, you need to retain your documents for the period of the, the, the duration of the person's employment and for a further two years after they stop working for you. Um, and for those of you that are sponsors, you'll know that your specific tier two documents that you need to keep, um, you only need to keep for a year after the employment ends. Um, so just be aware that um, a situation can arise where you might have to keep some documents for longer um, for the, the, the same employee. Your documents can be retained either in hard copy um, or in digital format. Um, but the important thing is that they should be readily accessible should the Home Office require sight of them. So should the Home Office um, decide to do a, a compliance check with you, um, you need to know where the documents are held. Um, and it doesn't matter how they're held as long as you can get your hands on them. And my final tip, and probably one that's the most practically useful, I think, would be to use the Home Office checklist. The Home Office on their website have a checklist that goes through step by step how you carry out a right to work check and what documents you should retain. So I think it's a really useful tool. 
Um, and I really would encourage you to print out a copy or keep a copy digitally for each employee. And that way you are absolutely covering your back in terms of your right to work checks. You've gone through it step by step. You've retained the documents that you need to um, and everything's there in a, a neat package for the home office if they ever ask for it. So that's probably my top tip is to use the tools that are there for you to make sure you're carrying out the, the checks properly. Um, so that's my top 10 tips. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. I can see okay, there's one the question. Bubble. Yeah, there's one question that's coming here about do we need to record evidence an employee may get from the settlement scheme? <clears throat> so, um, technically at the moment, no, um, you, you don't. So at the moment, as long as you've got their EU passport and a copy of that retained or their, their national ID card, that's enough. However, going forward from next year, you will have to have proof that they're under the, the settlement scheme. So. If an employee is saying to you at this stage, I've registered under the scheme, they will be able to to prove that to you. They will be able to show you that online. And I would suggest that you you retain that now um, just to get a head start um, because it, it's not mandatory just now, but it is going to become. Um, and I think somebody is asking if you take a copy of the front of the passport. No, that's not necessary. As long as you've got the biometric page, um, then that should be sufficient. And I would always just um, make sure that you're copying that and you're dating that, um, whether you're retaining it digitally or, or a hard copy, just make sure that you're keeping a date, um, you're, you're keeping a note of the date that you took the, the copy and that should be fine. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Nikki. As I say, I've, I've never been so glad to see you. <laughs> I, I can sometimes cover other people's employment parts, but I could never ever cover other people's parts. I'm absolutely delighted that you on the session today. Um, obviously, if you need any assistance with any immigration stuff, then do give her a, a shout. She's she's totally fab. So, um, and as I say, I hope you've I hope your mum's listened to all your advice and you've charged her fully <laughs> for it. <laughs> Um, well, listen. We'll finish up there for today. It's, it's been uh, it's been stressful and <laughs> had its ups and downs. Um, but just to say to you, we'll be doing another one of these in a couple of months' time. That's the idea. Now we're going to do them every couple of months. Look out for the Webex once we get the guidance on the job support scheme. If you're uh, looking to use that at all, um, we'll send the recording out to you, and we'll send out the recording from the session on Tuesday too on the job support scheme just so that you've got them both in the one place. The other thing I was going to mention to you was we recently published a paper on menopause in the workplace um, so we can attach a copy of that as well if you've not already got it. And finally, finally, I promise um, we've been running week long courses dealing with issues around about uh, change in the workplace as a result of COVID. So a session on collective consultation, a session on individual consultation, a session on changing terms and conditions, CHUPE, which is my absolute favourite, um, and also just the working environment in light of COVID. So we run, the next time we're going to run that is the week commencing the 23rd of November, and it's a one hour session each lunchtime. Um, so if anybody is interested in signing up for those, then do let me know. Um, the idea is to just try and help as everybody's going through change in the workforce to, to try and give you some of the information that you need um, if you've not already got it. So with that, I'll let you all go and have your lunch. Thank you as always for joining us and uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. All right, take care. Bye now.